church? My name is Kelsey and I serve on staff here at Elevate and I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning. If this is your first time checking us out, we are so glad that you found us. We are currently in a series of messages called Vows and we are believing that God is going to strengthen relationships and marriages through what we're going to be learning. So I wanna invite you to enter into a time of worship with us and ask God to prepare your heart for how he wants to speak to you today.
so much for worshiping with us. You can go ahead and take your seat. Hey, welcome everyone. We are so glad that you are here today. I don't think you are here by accident. And I'm excited because we're launching a, a three-part message series called Vows. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but there are marriages struggling all over the place. And I believe this is not acceptable to God. That God has so much more for us, so much better for us. And we want to invest in the lives of those who, who hope to one day be married so you don't say years later, I wish I would have known, you know, that back then. No, we want to equip you with spiritual truth today that will prepare you for the relationships that God uh, has for you tomorrow. And to also speak directly to existing marriages, to strengthen them, encourage them, and see them become everything that God would want them to become. As we get started, I'm curious, who in this room or watching online has made a mixtape? before. I'm not talking about a playlist on Spotify or burning CDs. I'm talking about an, an old school cassette tape player where you had to hit the record button and play button simultaneously. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm talking about listening to Casey Kasem until just the right song came on that you wanted to record that would express your deepest desires for love in just the right way. And you made it because, you know, telling a girl, close your eyes, Give me your hand. You know, that sounds a little bit creepy, but playing the song, you know, making a mixtape could express it in a way that you wanted to say it. Now, I've made several mixtapes. Now, I know when it comes to finding, though, true love, this can be a scary proposition. Like, you want to find the right person and at the same time, try to avoid all the wrong ones. And when it comes to relationship, we're all asking the question, who? Who? Like, who's the best person that will bring meaning and hope or security into my life? We ask the question, who's my soulmate? Or who's the, the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? Or, or here it is, who's the person that's going to make me happy? And, and you're looking for the who. And, and maybe if you're not looking for the who, you might be looking at who you are already with. And you're, you might even be saying, I'm not sure if it is him. Maybe I got the, the wrong who sitting by me. Whatever it is, I think there is a fundamentally better question to ask first. And that is, why? Why? Why should I seek a relationship to begin with? Or, or why should we be getting married? Or why should I endure the marriage that I'm currently in? Why is a big question. And I would submit it's a way more important question. Now, culture would suggest that the why is because, well, they make me feel the butterflies and I just want to feel the butterflies. Can I tell you something? Butterflies die. The average lifespan of a butterfly is two weeks, some even two days. Or, or people will say, well, it's how they make me feel. You know, she completes me. And that's, that's culture's definition of why. But God's word has an infinitely greater definition of why. And I want to help us firm up why by looking at two different places in God's word today. Luke chapter 12 and Genesis 24. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus is talking to some people that, that don't have uh, much to their name. They're wrestling with a lot of fear as it relates to God's provision for their, their life. Is there going to be enough? You know, is there going to be enough food? Is there going to be enough clothing or, or basic needs met? That's what they're asking. They didn't, they didn't have, you know, closets full of clothing like we do. They didn't have freezers full of food. You know, basically they had what they needed for that day. They lived day to day. And the idea of having enough back then is very significant. It's a big deal. And it's incredibly hard for us to relate to. 
And listen to what Jesus says to them. He says, don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father already knows your needs. See, somebody needs to hear that today. Hey, your father in heaven knows your needs. And when I read that, it's like this weight is kind of lifted off my shoulders. Like when you read that, it's can we all just take a, a deep collective you know, breath, all the stuff that you're stressing about, all the stuff you're, you're worried about, the work, bills, everything that you're carrying around, finances or stuff in your marriage and relationships, like questions of maybe I married the wrong one or I thought they were the right one, but, but now he's a jerk. You know, all that stuff that is related to, man, am I ever going to find the right one or could she be the right, the right one? Am I ever going to, you know, marry the right one or which dating website should I should I go to to find the right one which by the way there's like 2400 of them all of that stuff he knows your needs and the first thing you need to remember is your father in heaven who loves you already knows your needs that you have and not not just physical needs but your need for companionship for love for fulfillment security god knows your needs. So the question for you and the question for me today is, do I really believe that? Do I really believe he already knows? And then how do I access that? Well, the good news is the very next verse tells us. It says, seek. Somebody shall seek. Just seek. You know, listen, just because I'm not in the room today does not mean you need to sit there and not participate. Somebody say, seek. Seek, seek the kingdom of God above all else. In other words, seek the kingdom of God above that girl or that guy. Seek the kingdom of God above getting married. Seek the kingdom of God above being single. And if you do, what's the result of that? These are the, the words of Jesus, he says, and he will give you everything that you what need. It doesn't say everything you want. I want Brad Pitt on a white horse. No, I didn't say that. Listen, if we could just grab a hold of this right here and apply it to our relationships, we could pray, go home, and call it good. But the challenge is we all go, well, if I could just have that girl or if I could just meet that guy, you know, with shredded abs and, and chiseled features, not unlike that of Pastor Colby's, if I could just meet the one, then I'll be fulfilled. I'll be happy. And often what we think we want God knows is not what we need. Or if I could just get married, all my problems would go away. Like, we all know better than that. But Jesus comes along and says, hey, wait, wait, wait. Put God first. Seek him first. It's not about a relationship. It's about the relationship. And if you could get this, like, you wouldn't worry. You wouldn't feel any less if you are single. You wouldn't feel any less if you are struggling through some things right now in your relationships. No, you know what you would do? You would square your shoulders. You would stand firm because you knew that the creator of the universe has not only the ability but the desire to give you everything that you need. If you will seek him above all else, he'll provide everything that you need. And listen, maybe you're married here today and your relationship is struggling. I want you to hear this. Seeking God and putting him first is the one thing, don't miss this, that you can do. The one thing you can do that will really change your heart and your life from the inside out. And so we're going to look at relationships over the next few weeks from all different perspectives. However, before we go any further... You need to know you can't change anybody. Like we wish we could. You know, some of us still believe perhaps that we can. Like some of you got married so that you could change that person. Like I'm going to make an honest man out of him. How's that working out for you? See, some of us got into a relationship because, well, I'm going to fix them. And I just want to remind you, you can't change anybody. However, if you will focus on first seeking God and allowing him to change you 
from the inside out, change how you respond to things, how you are impatient, change how we are selfish, we all are, change the way that we react in certain situations, then maybe he didn't change or she didn't change, but you did. Your perspective did, your heart did. And I know it's easy in a series like this to go, man, I hope my husband is listening or I hope my wife is listening, but you know who God has here listening right now? You. So Jesus has given us a great principle here. And it's a promise that if you will seek God as your first love, don't miss this, he will lead you to your true love. Not in, say, your romantic love. It could be that he'll lead you to a deeper love with God, with others, or with family. But you seek God first. Now, of course, people start seeking relationships at a very early age. I remember in the fifth grade sending a note to Tisha White, who had a twin sister, identical twin named Tria. And these girls, they were it. Like, it was their milkshake that were bringing all the boys to the yard, if you know what I'm talking about. But I really wanted to, to, to be with Tria, as in be with her official boyfriend, girlfriend type of thing. But my friend Jamie was already with her. But I remember sending notes, will you be my girlfriend? Check yes, no, or maybe. You remember those notes? Check out this kid. Uh, he sends this note and it says this, look at it, Dear Ashley, Will you please be my girlfriend? I like you a lot. And then he puts yes, no, or maybe. And Ashley responds, I'm sorry. I already have a boyfriend, Kyle. But when we break up, you are my next choice. Then look, P.S. That will probably be in a month or two. Ashley is smart. Come on. I mean, she's keeping her options open. Like She's like, hang in there for a month, you know, and I'll see what I can do. Now, I want us to look at a story in the book of Genesis. Uh, this is a very different time, very different culture, but it's a great story of someone really seeking a spouse, seeking a relationship. And let's see if we can't draw some principles out of it that apply to our lives. Abraham, he's trying to find a wife for his son, Isaac. And God's given Abraham this great promise that through him, he's going to create you know, this great nation of Israel. And the challenge is Abraham is far from his homeland. And he's seeking someone from his background, his bloodline, his beliefs to fulfill the promise of God. And where he was, the, the dating pool was extremely limited. Anybody feeling that way today? Like the dating pool is, is limited where you are. So don't miss this. He's not just seeking any person for his son Isaac. He's not just looking for a warm body, he's seeking the promise of God, someone that shares his core convictions, his background, his beliefs. So right off the bat, we see he went into his pursuit with a purpose, pursuing people with purpose, not, not pursuing people with position or even just passion. And what we're gonna see in the story is you and I pursue God's purpose, God fulfills his promise. And so he asks his servant, he says, hey, go back to my homeland and find a bride for my son. But notice, even his servant seeks God first. Check it out in Genesis chapter 24. He's on this pursuit. He's got this caravan. He's got all these camels with him. So look at it with me, starting in verse 12. He says, oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed, please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing here beside the spring and the young women of the town are coming to draw water. This is my request. He says, I will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. And if she says, yes, have a drink and I will water your camels too, then let her be the one you have selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I will know you have shown unfailing love to my master. Now we read that and we're kind of like, what is that? Like what's going on? Because this is kind of the equivalent of going to Starbucks and going, all right, God, I'm done with this single thing. We're wrapping this up today. So the first girl who walks in and orders a grande vanilla latte, let her be the one. And I'm just going to wait right here. See, the problem is somebody walks in, orders a grande vanilla latte, and you're like, mm, nope, that's not the one. Um, let it be the next one. You know, So this is a, a weird request, is it not? I don't recommend this technique. 
Or, okay, God, the next DoorDash driver that shows up to my house, let him be the one. And you open up the door and you go, what it do, boy? You know, so don't do this. There's a lot more going on here in this story. First of all, he prayed. He's at this natural spring well in a, the cooler part of the day, which was a great time to go because all the ladies would come out to draw water. He's traveled hundreds of miles to put himself in a position to pursue someone of God's promise. So he's looking for someone that shares the faith and the perspective that will align with his masters. And he's waiting there. And admittedly, this is a little unconventional, but here's what I think we can pull out of it. That it's entirely possible, don't miss this, to place yourself in surroundings where you are way more likely to meet the kind of people that you want to meet. Like if you are single and dating, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say the kind of people that you wanna meet for a godly relationship are probably not people trolling the club at 2.30 a.m. during last call. Not if you love Jesus and not if you care about things like, like character. The, the guy smoking, you know, dubs in the back of the bar is probably not the guy that you want to build a life with. I'm just saying. But people do this all the time, do they not? They say, oh man, I love Jesus. You know, I go to the Elevate Church thing on Christmas and Easter, and, but now I'm up in the club and, and doing my thing here. It's probably not the best place to pursue a relationship. Now, I'm not saying it can't happen because some of you are going, that's where I met my man, that's where I met my woman. But listen, God is a God of miracles. Anything can happen. I'm just saying as a principle, there's a better place to position yourself to meet people who share your values and convictions. And don't forget, like what's the overarching promise in all of this that we said, seek God first. If Jesus is first in your life, you will position yourself around people and places that reflect that core conviction. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for frustration and heartache Listen, I had a friend come to me about a year or so ago and he was all excited. He's like, man, I think I found the one. I found the one. She's awesome. We've been dating for a couple months now. And I'm like, great, that's awesome, man. I'd love to meet her. And he told me, well, I haven't talked to her much about the church thing or the Jesus thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's going to be a problem for you. This will be an issue. Maybe not immediately during the first 18 months of, of infatuation, but think about this, like what if you stay in that relationship and what if you stay together, you start having children and you start you know, talking about how you're going to raise your children or how you will navigate your faith in the future with your family, it will be a huge issue if you are on different pages. And so we see this in the story that they are seeking God first. The servant is placing himself in a position to encounter people who share the same core values and things that Isaac would share in his heart. And it's all about seeking God as your first love and he will lead you to your true love. So seek God first. Here's the second thing we're going to seek. Character. Seek character. Match.com did a survey and they asked, what are the factors used most in selecting a first date? Here's what they found. Teeth, grammar, hair, and clothes. In other words, your container is more important than your content. Or how you look is way more important than, than what you put in your profile. It's all about how you look. And I'm not saying that the container isn't important. It certainly is important. There's nothing wrong with that. You should find a, a set of teeth and hair and clothes that you can live with, but you need to find someone that you can live with when the container breaks down because teeth fall out. Come on, somebody. Hair thins. Skinny jeans go out of style. Like containers change, but character lasts. Look what happens in this story. In verse 17, it says, running over to her, the servant said, please give me a little drink of water from your jug. Yes, my Lord, she answered, have a drink. And she quickly lowered the jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. When she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough. Don't miss that. 
So she quickly emptied the jug into the watering trough and ran back to the well to draw water for his camels. Now check this out. And I missed this the first time I read it. We learned earlier this guy had like 10 camels with him. One camel can drink up to 25 gallons of water. So to fully water 10 camels, this girl would descend about a dozen steps carrying a jug like a, a Culligan water jug on her shoulder, fill up a trough somewhere around 60 to 80 times, two hours of sweaty, hard labor. Come on, like tell the truth. How many of you would be like, listen bro, you can water your own camels. You see what a big ask this was? Like this was way more than, all right God, you know, I'm not just looking for the guy, you know, who orders a latte. This was, I'm looking for someone extraordinary who not only comes along and is generous and shares her water and her time, but is also a, a servant first. Someone who is aware enough to realize, hey, this guy's on a journey and I want to demonstrate extreme hospitality. Someone who goes way beyond what's expected and says, I'll water your camels too while you're here. It demonstrated she was, first of all, generous. Like even though it wasn't culturally, culturally um, expected of her. She wasn't afraid to you know, do hard work. She was resilient. She was strong enough to finish what she'd started. She did not have this princess kind of mindset. Can you, can you picture this? Here are these fully capable men in this caravan watching as this girl makes her 50th trip or so up and down these steps to get water. And some of you are like, sounds a lot like my husband. <laughs> and I know it can seem insensitive, but he's not simply sitting there watching her, he's testing her, trying to find out what she's made of, trying to find out what kind of person she is. What is he looking for? Character. Character is critical because character is what keeps you together after the cosmetics begin to fade. It's like, you know, when you fall in love with someone, you enter into what scientists call romantic infatuation. It actually changes the, the chemicals in your brain. So for the first 18 to 24 months of being with someone, you've got this chemical crippling of your brain because you're in love. And what happens when you're in love? You don't see their faults, right? You don't see their flaws, they're, they're perfect, they're amazing. Your brain has been chemically crippled. We'll always be in love. You'll say things like, it will always be this way. We'll never fight, we'll always feel the butterflies. In fact, you might be here today going, we have never had a fight. Then chances are you got married yesterday. Why are you even here if that's the case? Like we, we say she's perfect or he's perfect or I love him or I love her. And then what, 18 months later, we say things like, I don't even understand her. <laughs> Some of you, you know, your kids are 17, 18, 19 years old and they're like, mom, dad, I'm in love. And, and you get it because you've been there. You remember those feelings in high school, but it doesn't matter what you say or how hard you try to bring it back to reality in their mind, you know, they're running through the fields to the sound of music, you know, thinking no one in history, you know, has ever loved the way that we love, has ever felt this way. And you know what that is? It's a chemical crippling of your brain. Gary Thomas said it this way about romantic infatuation. He says, romantic infatuation makes women prefer men with dominant personalities, even though these men are less likely to express companionship, emotional attachment, and the relational skills desired over the long term. So if a woman follows her feelings, she's going to end up with a guy that thrills her for 18 months and frustrates her for five decades. Some of you are thinking, how does he know my marriage? And he says this about the guys. He says men who tend to follow their feelings alone tend to go for looks and charm, and those are guaranteed to change. In other words, we're all gonna change. And when you're dating someone, I want you to please consider how they treat other people, how they interact with people. Do they show decency and respect to coworkers? Are they rude and demeaning? Do they hold grudges? Or do they extend forgiveness because eventually they will be that way to you? Not now. Not for the first 18 months or so, because we have romantic infatuation. 
But after that, you're left with what? Character. When everything else is stripped away, character is what remains. Looks are important. You want to be attracted to them. Yes, I get it. But at the end of the day, you are left with character. So you might ask the question, so Colby, what do I do? Like, what do I do before I arrive there that, that far into a relationship? Well, you ask character questions. Like, do they think the world revolves around them? Ask them. Are they encouraging and are they servant hearted or do they honor marriage and hold it in high regard? Ask them, do they follow through with commitments, even small ones or especially small ones? Do they work hard or are they, you know, pretty lazy? Because who you end up with at the end of the day is that person and their character. And maybe you're going, well, that's great, Colby, but I already married her, all right? already married him and the infatuation is long gone and we haven't run through the fields to the sound of music in a long long time in fact there's lots of things we haven't done in a long time you you might even say our mixtape sounds less like eternal flame and more like metallica like it's hardcore it's just it's drama drama and that's where some of you might be right now so in that case the only person you can control listen is you like as long as you focus on their faults and their failure, you are focusing on things that you can't control. Sure, you can gripe about it, you can complain and moan and nag, and maybe that's what you do, but it does not work. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It generally drives them further away, makes them you know, even more bitter, more angry, causes them to dig in and continue the behaviors just to annoy you, or at least that's what you imagine in your mind. And so here we are, and all you can do is to say, God, change my character, change my heart. God, work in my life. Help me be more loving. Help me you know, feel like you know, I, I'm, I'm doing all that I can to better our relationship. Seek God first. And while you can't control them, you can influence them through your love and character, but you can never influence through nagging. Listen, our job is to love that person. It's God's job to change them. Come on, seek God first, seek character. And then here's the last one I wanna give you, seek commitment. So the way that the rest of the story plays out in Genesis chapter 24, you know, clearly from another time and another culture, but the servant goes to Rebecca's house and he identifies himself and says, hey, I'm here to find a wife for my master's son, Isaac. And she agrees to go. So verse 64 says, when Rebecca looked up and saw Isaac, she quickly dismounted from her camel. Who's that man walking through the fields to meet us? In other words, she was like, who's that? And, and he replied, it's my master's son. So Rebecca covered her face with her veil. Then the servant told Isaac everything he had done and Isaac brought Rebecca into his mother's tent and she became his wife, like boom, done. Keep reading, it says he loved her deeply. It's interesting as you continue to read their story, it's far from perfect. Adjusting to this new relationship, you know, they had struggles with infertility, uh, you know, they got pregnant with twins and, you know, they had this economic breakdown that happened. They had this brush with adultery. The oldest son marries someone who worships other gods and all this turmoil, this huge mess, this whole family begins to implode. And you know what that sounds like to me? Modern day marriage, drama, friction, challenges. It's not easy. However, it's commitment that keeps it together. Commitment is what's going to keep you together through all the disappointments that go on, through all the challenges of, of life. I asked Kristen just this week, uh, you know, because I'm feeling pretty good about the marriage. And so I asked her, hey, you know, have I disappointed you recently in our marriage? And I'm thinking, you know, I caught her off guard. You know, she's going to have to think long and hard about this, probably not going to be able to come up with anything, you know, at all to say. I, I was half expecting her to look at me and go, what? Disappoint me? You could never disappoint me. Like, like come on, guys, you, you don't ask the question unless you know the answer, right? So I asked her the question. I'm, you know, you know not thinking I'm opening Pandora's box, 
you know, because I, I want to know what's going on inside. So I say, have I disappointed you recently? And she goes, yep. Like no pause, no hesitation. And I'm like, well, how? You know, now I'm getting a little defensive and she starts, you know, telling me three to four things. Well, you know, you didn't do this. You didn't put the, the dishes up and I asked you to do this or change that, that thing out and fix this thing that was going on and the, all, this, all this different stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah, like you're right. I, I did do that. I forgot to do those, those things. Marriage and relationships are all about commitment and leaving room for one another's faults. Colossians says this, make allowance for each other's faults. The language is that of, of going on a trip. It's like packing a bag. And when you're packing you know, for a relationship or a marriage, you have to leave extra room in that bag for faults, for mistakes and failures and, and struggles and challenges because you're gonna have them. Some of you ladies, right, when you go on a trip, you pack an extra suitcase. It's your, your shopping suitcase. You're planning on filling that thing up and bringing some stuff home. Well, maybe, just maybe, you need to pack a relational suitcase for him or for her because you're gonna need to leave room for that commitment to grow. So the first thing we gotta do is seek God. Seek God first above all else and then seek character. Make sure we're going after the thing that's going to continually last in people and then also seek commitment. And let's leave room for one another's faults. Hey, would everyone pray with me? God, thank you so much for an opportunity to strengthen our relationships, to strengthen our marriages, but also to set people up for success that are looking for a future husband or a future wife, God. We know that you want us to um, pursue people of purpose and people, God, of your promise. And so help us to get in right situations, right surroundings in order to do that well. And God, I just pray right now for those that are struggling perhaps in this room, that they would take this season, God, to focus on not controlling each other, God, but being able to, to change the things that we can only change in our life. God, maybe soften our hearts towards our spouses, soften our hearts towards one another so that we could grow in our relationships together. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a powerful and challenging message. I hope you've been inspired, encouraged, and ready to grow in your faith in Jesus. I'm not sure what your next step might be, but we would love to connect with you. And if this teaching impacted your life and you would like to help support this ministry, you can give online from wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us online today. And if you're ever in the Erie, Pennsylvania area, we'd love to have you join us in person.